so I'll just give a, a quick introduction again for those, uh, those who are just joining us. Uh, this is a presentation on the Landowner's Guide to Marketing Timber by Dr. Jerry Bettis. He's our forestry specialist here at uh, Virginia Cooperative Extension at, at Virginia State University. He's been with us for about two years and uh, he has a wealth of experience to draw on. If you all want to ask questions, you can do it in the chat during his presentation or there will also be a question period after and this is also being recorded. So Dr. Bettis, you can go ahead. Okay, good morning again. Uh, my name is Jerry Bettis, Forestry Specialist of Virginia State, and, and the title of our presentation is Landowner's Guide to Marketing Timber. And as uh, Mark said, chime in with any questions at any time, um, particularly when they come to you, because you'll forget them if you're waiting until the end of the presentation. It makes the presentation go a, a lot better when you ask questions up front. The, before you sell your timber, the first thing you want to do is hire a consultant forester. And uh, you, will, you will ask, why can't I find a consultant forester for my area? You can Google, Google up consultant forester for your county, or you can go to the Virginia Department of Forestry, uh, uh, you can go to the Association of Consultant Forestry and Foresters and get a list of foresters in your area. Another way, and probably the most advisable way in my opinion, is to ask your neighbors, your woodland only neighbors, to recommend a consultant forester. Find out who has cut timber in your area and and see if they will recommend that person uh, to harvest your timber. Because like any profession, knowledge and experience varies widely. So you, you can get all kinds of uh, consultant forces. You can get good, good ones, bad ones, and, and, and in the middle, if you will. And uh, if you sell your timber without the assistance of a consultant forester, as I maintain, you've committed the number one cardinal sin for being uninformed. You want to be well informed about how to sell timber, uh, and to do that is to hire a consultant forester. Why is it a cardinal sin? Because you you have uh, you only sell timber for once or twice in a lifetime. You have years of growth wrapped up in a single transaction and you want to get the best you, price you can for selling those timbers. I maintain that you would not try to sell your house without the aid of a consultant forester, or well, excuse me, without a realtor, and you shouldn't try to sell timber without the aid of a consultant forester. Timber is a commodity. Demand and price fluctuate widely. There's no daily market price report or government price support. So what that means is the price of timber in the northern part of your county and the price of timber in the southern part of the county can vary widely. Unlike selling hogs and chickens and cows, where the price of, of hogs an hour is the same price that you get in North Carolina, timber does not work that way. There are a lot of things. Go ahead. Uh, there was a question here. Is there a trusted list of crop or forestry consultants? A trusted list? The, yeah. Yeah. Yes. The, uh, the Department of Virginia Department of Forestry has a list 4349776500. The, the, the Virginia Department of Forestry has a list of consulting forces in every county. And also, the Association of Consulting Forces will have a list of uh, consulting forces in the state. And uh, again, the best way to find one is to ask your willing only neighbor, because the neighbor will cut them up 
or work with them. In many cases, they will work with them more than just once. And they feel comfortable in working with a, a consultant partner and may be willing to recommend one to you. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay, did, did I answer the question? He said yes. Price depends on size, quality, and species and other inputs. It, it takes specialized knowledge to estimate the volume and value of timber. So, and you, you need to be in the market daily to know what's going on in your county and in uh, uh, your neck of the woods. Ask the following question before you sell your timber. What trees should I sell and buy? How soon shall I sell them? Are the property custom boundaries marked? What is, what is my volume? What's my timber volume? Again, these questions will be answered by a consultant for us. What is the fair market value of my timber? Are my trees financially mature? Again, the consultant for will help you with these questions. You want to make sure that you sell only mature, financially mature trees as opposed to immature or biologically mature. What's the volume? What's the growth rate? Who and where are the appropriate timber buyers? What's my sale method? That is, are you going to sell lump sum? Are you going to sell pay as cut? Lump sum is where you get all your money up front. If you got 100 acres of timber and it's worth $1,000 an acre, then when you sell lump sum, you get the $100,000 up front before cutting commence. And, and, and pay is cut is where you get the, you get paid once the, or the, the timber has been cut and moved to the mill. The method that I recommend is lump sum. That's the textbook record of method. Do I know my basis? What is your basis? If your timber worth, excuse me, if you paid $100,000 for your timber 10 years ago, then your land and timber basis is $100,000. You must allocate a portion of that basis to the land and a portion of that basis to the timber. Say you, out of that $100,000, you, you might say my land is worth $25,000 and my timber $70,000. And you do that for tax purpose. Dr. Bettis? Yes. There's a question here. Where do you go to look up the market value daily? You go to the consultant for it. As I said, there is no there's no there's no daily price report. There's no market support either. You're on your own. That's why I recommend that you hire a consultant forester as opposed to selling hogs or chicken, where there is a price report every day. We don't have one for timber. Okay, thank you. The other question you asked is, how is my income tax? Is it taxed as long as a long-term gain or capital gain? How should I reforce the harvest area? Your consultant forester should help you with that. How you get advice, you should have that person in your back pocket before you start. So you have someone that you can rely on for good information. How timber is measured? Forces inspect via timber crews. They measure the merchantable timber, systematic sample of plots or strip crews, and your crews is designed to give statistical confidence. And your forester, as you can see on the right here, will be able to help you with that. But well, she's measuring the diameter of uh, a hardwood tree. Too many minutes are required, height and diameter. For saw logs, you want the number of 16 foot logs to an eight inch top. For puff wood, you want the merchant book uh, tree to a three inch top. 
a bit more stick or uh, other measuring devices used to estimate diameter. You can see this person is estimating diameter with a what we call a diameter tape. Two rules of, of, for your law rule, two, two measurements are necessary, diameter and height. The volume is estimated in board feet. Grade, grade and quality will impact the, the value of your timber. The international, the door, the screen, the law rule are the three law rules that we use. In, in Virginia, most people use the door rule as far as legal dispute is concerned, we use the international one quarter rule. And you'll see why uh, there's a difference in those three rules uh, shortly. The law rule used significantly impact your volume estimate. If the buyer and seller are aware, any rule will work. All you gotta do is adjust the price accordingly. That's why the, when, when I'm talking about adjusting price, you need to have that consultant for it in your back pocket. Here's an example. A 14 inch diameter burst height tree with two 16 foot logs. On the international one quarter, <clears throat> excuse me, that tree has 130 board feet. Under the scrimmage rule, that tree has 115 board feet. And under the door rule, that tree has 75 board feet. So you see, it's almost twice the difference between the door and the international. The door is what's used in Virginia. The international, one quarter, is the legal rule of dispute. So uh, it pays to have a consultant and partial working with you who understand the difference between uh, the volume estimate of these three law rules. Assume timber is selling for $130 a thousand. Under the international one quarter, that tree that we talked about, the, the 14 inch diameter two saw log tree is worth $16.90 on the international one quarter. 14 net, $14.95 on the Scribner rule and $9.75 on the Lador rule. As you can see, the price you get depending on the law rule is significant. All righty, to generate the same $16.90 of the international one quarter law rule, the timber must be selling for $146.96 under the Scribner rule. And, or it must be selling for $225.33 under the door rule. That makes the, these prices are the prices that make them equivalent. That it make all three law rules equivalent. Weight and other measurements are now being used. But what we do, we just load the truck drive it onto a scale, weigh it, and estimate the volume. Because we can't estimate the volume while the, while the trees are standing. Not, excuse me, we can't estimate the weight while the trees are standing. We, we can't estimate the volume. Lump sum, pay is cut, are the, are the two methods that uh, you sell your timber. Verify and accurately convert the units to familiar units. Weight scaling is inaccurate due to tree species, growth rate, soils, and other factors. That means as much as a 35% difference in the way of the equivalent volume of log, uh, volume of wood. And what we mean by that is in the Piedmont, you can have a thousand board feet of blah blah pine. <clears throat> And in the coastal plain, you can have a thousand board feet of lava of pine. And the weight of, the, of those, those volumes would be as much as 35% different. And that's basically due to water. So we got more marshes down on the coast than we have in the Piedmont. Price to affect and timber stumpage prices, CC.
stem quality, size, product type, acreage, location, site condition, market, and contractual provision. Under the species, generally speaking, pines are priced higher than mixed hardwood. However, quality hardwood can bring a premium price. Species price vary widely with location and market demand. Again, that is why you need a consultant forester, someone who's in the market on a daily basis and who knows what's happening to the prices. The prices can vary significantly from one part of the county to the other, depending on, on the conditions, the market conditions. Quality and size. Lumber, veneer, export products, beware of high grading. What's high grading? High grading is where you cut the best and leave the rest. And we did that 100 years ago. We don't do that any longer. So what you want to do when you, you're partially cutting, you want to cut the poor quality trees and leave the best to grow uh, as a crop tree. Product type, pulpwood, chip and saw, saw log, veneer, piling, poles, and ply logs. Hardwood, product type, pulpwood, saw logs, and veneer logs for export. This is very value based on the product quality and market conditions. Acres and volume. Logging is capital intensive. If you have a small track, if you have poor quality, have difficult logging conditions, or lower price. The term of, term of value increase with volume and acreage. However, acreage and volume are less of concern if you have top quality and top grade uh, or timber. Location, distance to meal, restriction, accessibility, the ease of logging all affect the price of the timber that you get. The ideal block is a block that's beside the payroll, near the meal, and without contractual restrictions. Low price will result with greater distance to meal and difficult logging conditions. Compared to markets, have a sealed bid because it assures a fair market price. So what's a sealed bid? A sealed bid is where each buyer will bid on your timber in an envelope, sealed envelope. And he gives that envelope to you. You open it on a certain date, let's say uh, May 14th, 10 o'clock. Everybody who's interested in buying it will be there. And you open up the first bid, $100,000. The second bid, $150,000. And the third bid, $200,000. And you will sell your timber to the highest bidder, $200,000, assuming that the highest builder estimate is it meets the, the, the estimate that you and your consultant for us to come up with. Advertising influence the builders, negotiate with a specialized product and unusual harvesting condition and poor market. Contractual provisions. They protect the site, the land on the interest, and the residual trees. However, the more provisions you have, the cheap, the less you're going to get on your on your for, for your timber. Restrictions should be placed in the timber sale contract or the timber deed. A question? Be well informed. Aggressively mark your timber. Be business-like because buyers have confidence in the business-like approach. The reason I say you need a consultant forester is not just my opinion, but research has shown that it's worth the consultant forester is worth his his soul or her soul. 
it, the research shows that you get 23% more per acre, 64% higher price per board foot, and 120% more on protected future income. So here's evidence that is it is it, 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 it worth going out and paying 10% of the gross gross sales to hire a consultant for. Sell financial material timber only, otherwise use a partial cut. Leave the best trees to grow, harvest the poor quality trees. If you have an appropriate acre, you can get a short term loan. If you got a hundred, say you got a hundred acres of immature timber and you need money now, you can go to the bank and ask for a short term loan on and you will mortgage the timber uh, to the banker to get that loan. When the, Timber matures, you harvest it and pay the pay the uh, the banker uh, his uh, his share plus interest. Know the market, have a reforestation plan, mark the sale boundaries. Again, I can't say this enough. Use a consultant forester. Inform your neighbors. Why would you want to inform your neighbors? Because you might need access across your neighbor's property, or if you have a small block, less than 30 acres, let's say, uh, the two of you can amalgamate those acres. You can put those acres together and get a better harvesting price because the harvesting price reduces the amount of money that you get. Have access to the sale area. Advertise the, the sale, use a seal bid, have a pre-harvesting plan. So what's included in a pre-harvesting plan? The map, color and type of markings, forest type, slope, soil, harvest timing. You might want, you want to tell the, uh, uh, the buyer what time of the year you want him to harvest your timber. That's a function of whether you have uh, wet weather logging, or, or dry weather logging. Wet weather logging is just is an area that you can log during wet weather. Dry weather logging, of course, but it says an area that you can only harvest during dry weather. And you get a premium on wet weather logging. Location of haul roads, skid trail, loading de <clears throat> decks, water courses, streamside management zone, and designated stream crossing. All of that goes in the pre-harvest plan. And the pre-harvest plan, of course, it goes out to the, uh, so the buyers can inspect and know what they're getting into uh, before buying your timber. Allow at least a month for the buyers to inspect the timber. Sell a minimally accepted bid. And we said that earlier, what you want to do, you and your consultant estimate the volume of your timber, estimate the value of your timber, and set a bid. And if 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 the, the if the, if you get three bidders on your timber, and not one equals your minimum accepted, then you have a decision to make: Will I sell my timber now, or will I wait later and sell it next year? It depends on the. Uh, uh, how badly you need for uh, income. Again, the consultant forester will help you with that dollar amount. Reserve the right to refuse any and all bids. Of course, you put that in the uh, sale, sale announcement that the, that the seller reserves the right to sell any and all, to refuse any and all bids. And that's because if the bid, the the bid, the highest bid does not equal your low, then you have to decide whether you're gonna sell it now or sell it later. Small tracks, low volume, poor quality, poor access may require a negotiated sale as opposed to a lump sum sale. Have <clears throat> Excuse me. Have, have a professional but who is knowledgeable of legal provision prepare your, your agreement. The condition of the sale and sale maps are recorded in the deed 
a contract. Do not try to cover all eventualities. Just make sure it's complete enough to include the essentials of your transaction. Your consultant partial, again, will help you with that. The agreement should be understandable, workable, and enforceable by both parties. If it's not enforceable, then you don't have an agreement. Standing timber is real property, cut timber is personal property. A deed conveys interest in standing timber, a contract conveys interest in severed timber. Establish the conditions to which the buyer and seller agree and their rights and duties upon those conditions. Cutting contracts are used when timber is sold, pay is cut. Timber deed is used when they, when they are sold as lump sum. And the, the, uh, the, the title passes to the buyer once the trees are severed from the stump. So the, as long as the trees are standing, they belong to you. Once they've been harvested or severed from the stump, then they belong to the buyer. The deed is often used in a lump sum timber sale, provision of roads, fences, ditches, fields, and boundary trees. When you're writing the deed, the road should be left in as good a condition as it was found or better. All tops, and limbs should be removed from fences. All broken fences should be repaired. Tops and limbs should be removed from the ditches and fields. And the boundary trees should not be cut. The boundary trees should not be cut. You want to leave those. And also, you want to include a legal description of your property in that deed. The seller's signature is notarized constraints as limited in wet weather law and, um, and removal. Again, we mentioned wet weather logging and removal time. Uh, if it's wet weather logging, you should get a premium for your track of timber as opposed to dry weather logging. Too many constraints will increase the harvesting cost. Mutual confidence between the buyer and seller. Important papers should be notarized and registered at the courthouse. The seller pays for the deed preparation and the forester, uh, the 10% the consult consultant forester get. Parties should be aware of who cover what costs. You want to conclude in a uh, cordial and business-like manner because uh, buyers have confidence in business-like approach. Okay, any questions? Yes, sir. I have a question. Could you mention one more time why you would rather have wet weather cutting versus dry weather cutting? <clears throat> Wait just a minute. <clears throat> okay, what, what, let's, let's define the difference in the two first. Please. Wet weather logging is a track of timber that can be harvested during rainy season. Okay. Dry weather logging is a track of timber that can only be harvested during dry weather. Okay. Okay. And and for as for as for as the price is paid for those two those two products, there's a premium placed on wet weather logging because during the wet season it's difficult to find wet weather logging. If you have wet weather logging, the meal will pay you a premium usually. And the only way you're gonna get that premium is to make sure that you have a consult consulting forester or somebody has told you what you have. Otherwise, you might not know whether it's wet weather or dry weather. Okay. Generally speaking, wet weather soils are sandy soils, loamy soils. Dry weather soils are, dry weather soils are organic soils. Generally speaking. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions?
I don't see any others in the chat. Okay. I believe um, some people had asked if uh, you could make this presentation available. Yes, we can do that. Okay. We can, um, we can put it onto our website. Oh, wait, there is a question here. Is there a minimum size track that would be infeasible? Okay, what what loggers usually do is that they they base in feasibility based on the number of of uh, loads of timber coming from your land. So they they go out and estimate the volume, and they will understand how many loads per acre you have, or how many total loads you have. And generally speaking. But to get a logger to move onto your property, you need at least 20 loads of timber. Otherwise, the logger is not interested in coming on a, on a small track. And what I call a small track is a track that's 30 acres or less. And if you have a small track, what I recommend you doing is consulting with your neighbors, your, your willing only neighbors, See if they're interested, or he's interested, or she's interested in selling the timber. And the two of you can sell your timber at the same time to the same buyer. That means if you got 30 acres and your neighbor has 30 acres, then the, the track is now a 60 acre track as opposed to a 30 acre track. If you got a third neighbor who has 40 acres, it's a 100 acre track now. And and the larger the track, the cheaper the harvesting costs, the more money the landowner receives. Okay? Okay. So, oh, okay. There's another question here. Uh, would you be open to having a conversation with uh, Anthony Jones regarding the implications for the information in your presentation to be used as a basis for a proposal <clears throat> to the legislature as strategy for preserving heirs' property. Maybe you can just speak with him offline. Okay. If, he's, uh, if he had a question about that. Well, uh, have him to call me, 334-549-7139. Okay, all right. And another question here, uh, what is the difference between a forestry consultant and a broker? Can a broker sell trees? Okay, a, forestry, a broker, what brokers usually do is they work for a, a uh, processing facility. <laughs> they buy timber in the interest of the processing facility. When I worked at Warehouse, we we dealt with timber brokers all the time, and we would tell we would hire the broker. <laughs> we give him two dollars for every cord of wood that he delivered to our mill. A consultant forester works for the landowner. The broker doesn't work for the landowner. The broker for the processing facility. Consultant forester works for the landowner. And if you get one. Who, who is representing himself as a broker and consultant forester, run the other way. <clears throat> Did that answer? Uh, she thinks, oh, she said perfect, okay. Any more questions? Oh, okay, somebody said, just to let everyone know, there's several other t timber sales webinars. And then she, uh, she put a link into the chat also. Okay, any other questions? Ask now, forever hold your peace. 
I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, is there any way to get a certification that you attended this uh, virtual classroom? I don't think so. Do you all have a list that we have attended? Mark, do we have a list of all the attendees? Uh, we have a, a list of the people who signed up. So if you signed up, then you will be on there. Okay, I, I will need that to go to the USDA. Oh, if you want to type your uh, contact info in the chat, I can get it. I can get it from there. Beautiful. Thank you, sir. Okay, no problem. <laughs> and yeah, we, we will be putting this video up uh, probably on YouTube, maybe on Facebook, maybe on both. But if you do, if you do a search for um, VSU College of Agriculture, on face we have a facebook page and also a youtube channel i, I have a question this is uh, uh dana perkins i, I sent a chat about the market price and i understand your answer but my question is so if there isn't a market then how can a um forest stand owner um try to be aware of of when the best time to sell is what other tools or what's out there that we can look at to go, oh, okay, there's a lot of demand right now or whatever. Okay. Uh, let's say you do not have a consultant forester and you're interested in selling your timber. The Department of Forestry, the Virginia Department of Forestry, they'll come out and look at it and tell you whether it's mature or immature. But they will not tell you the price because they're prohibited from doing that by the law. So in order to know what the prices are, you have to be in the market on a daily basis. And, and that's where the consultant forester comes into play, who's in the market on a daily basis. No price reports, no daily price supports. Mm -hmm. Did that help? Yes, so the consulting forester that you work with would be the person who would say, okay, I know you want to do this and I will let you know when the right time to do it is. Usually that works that way. Okay, all right, thank you. Oh, wait a minute, let me mention this about a consulting forester. You need to get, when you're choosing one, you want to, you want to get, a, get a list of two or three, let's say three or four, at least three, and choose from those three because consulting forces are like, like doctors, they're good ones and bad ones. So be aware. Dr. Bettis? Yes. Uh, this is Dr. Ruffin. It's good to talk with you. And you are a rich, uh, excellent resource. My question is, um, in the selection of the three or four consultants, um, what would you advise as a length of contract? What what is that depend depending upon? Okay, dependent upon. It, it it usually works between you, the seller, and the buyer, and your consultant force will help you with what's what has been going on in your area, what tends to be the norm for your area. But uh, the length of a contract varies from from eighteen to thirty six months, and again. What's going to determine what the buyer asks for is whether it's wet weather logging or dry weather logging. That way, he'll have more options to to uh, work with if it's if it's wet weather logging. He'll put it in, in his his uh, his portfolio, and he won't harvest it until it's needed during wet weather. So you need, okay, you need to have about. 18 months, 24 months in the, uh, for the length of time. And if, uh, if, let's say you put 24 months in your contract and the buyer does not 
harvested in those 24 months, then you should put in your agreement that the, that the seller will grant an additional year or 6% of the gross price. So you don't just automatically, arbitrarily give them any addition in additional time without getting paid for that. Great, thank you. Why would you do that? Because you lose it if, if you give him another year and, and you're not paid for it, then you're losing what you could be getting by re, 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 regenerating that land and letting it grow up again. Thank you. Okay. Nice hearing from you. You too. Uh, Dr. Bettis, this is Dana again. I've got another question for you. Sorry mm -hmm. to ask so many questions. So, no, go ahead. So, so you're going to talk to multiple um, forestry consultants. Um, is there like a list of questions that you recommend that uh, um, specific, you know, ones that you definitely need to ask each one to try to help you uh, evaluate um, the prospective candidates? Yes. Uh, you want to ask him, can I, can you give a list of, let's say, three landowners with whom you work? You go out and talk to those landowners, ask them, can you see that property that was cut over, see if he did a good job. What I mean by a good job, is the land ready? All cheering up? That's a bad job. You don't want that law working for you. Or consultant parts are working with you because he did not supervise it supervise the sale well. So you want to get about three three blocks that you can look at, or three forces that you can look at and investigate and research on, on what's going on with the way they operate. Anything else? That's it? That's it. All right. Okay. Dr. Dr. Bettis. Yes. A couple of the questions that came up earlier, you might want to elaborate on. Uh, when you mentioned the, uh, I think a lady had a question about uh, the consulting foresters and you mentioned the Virginia Department of Forestry as a source that they will be able to help you with your uh, manage your forest, but not give you pricing. I think that, um, at least from my opinion, uh, folks shouldn't think about timber sales as a one-time event in the life of their forest, or even a once every 40 or 50 year event in the life of their forest. They should think of their forest more comprehensively, and that's where the Virginia Department of Forestry, or even a consulting forester, can help out by developing an overall management plan for the forest land that a landowner has. And harvesting would be just part of that overall forest management plan. So I want, I think folks should look at the timberland and the land they have in general as a more comprehensive approach to managing it and selling timber is just part of that management approach. And so you might want to elaborate on how the Virginia Department of Forestry through their foresters or even a consulting forester can help a landowner create an overall forest management plan or stewardship plan. And then timber harvesting is just a single component of that, um, of that management process. And they also, as you indicated, can help a landowner, Virginia Department of Forestry that is, can help a landowner in terms of determining when in the life of the forest might be a good opportunity to look at the potential of selling timber and just following that forest management plan that's developed. And secondly, the um, registered forester, uh, I think to advise landowners to, even when they're searching for a consulting forester or they're looking at someone who their neighbors, or as you said, other woodland owners may have used you want to be sure that they are uh, a registered forester. You might, might explain what registered forester means so that they're dealing, dealing with someone 
dealing with someone who's, um, who's, who's trained and certified and recognized to uphold standards of, of uh, not just the technical but ethical standards. Uh, so those are a couple of things. And then lastly, there was a landowner who, who was asking, you know, what's too small of a track of land to, to consider? I think you went into some really good detail about the factors that influence pricing, uh, location, time of year, the markets. So by having a professional working with you, they're gonna, as you said, Dr. Bettis, they're gonna understand all those factors. And even though you may have what is typically a small track of land, if a lot of those factors fall into place, then that small track of land, depending on what, you know, you said species and size, you listed all those factors, even a small track of land, what's considered a small track of land could be valuable at a given point in time. And again, that's where having a professional who understands those daily markets can help guide a landowner, even though they may have a, a what's considered a quote unquote small track of land. So that that topic, the registered forester, and then utilizing the Virginia Department of Forestry, forestry as a, a source of having a forestry development overall forest management plan where timber cells are just a component of that overall forest management plan. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. How are you doing? Doing great, man. I'm glad I got the email about the, the, the webinar and um, I'm glad I was able to sign in on it. Sure. Thank you. Uh, you did a good job. You did a good job on that. Uh, one, other, uh, uh, one other thing that the uh, consultant forest uh, the uh, the division, Virginia Department of Forestry can do when they develop that management plan, they can let you know that whether you have the option to lease your land or hunting, hunting rights. So as Victor said, harvesting is just one step in a long process of, in that management regime that you might have or the strategies that you might use around managing your timber. Okay. Dr. Bettis, there was another question in the chat. Um, I am a horseman. In consideration of clear pasture necessity, can you negotiate stump removal and what kind of price pro or detract would that be? I don't know anything about stump removal. Uh, I have no idea about the price or what method they may use. Uh, a long time ago, uh, back in the 80s, we did some stump removals research where we, we actually pulled the stumps out of the ground, had a machine that pulled the stumps out of the ground. So I don't know how people remove stumps now for clearing land for a pasture. I'm sorry, I can't help you. Okay, thank you. Okay, any more questions for Dr. Bettis? Otherwise, thank you for attending. Uh, you can always take a look at our webpage, which is ext.vsu.edu. We have information on there uh, related to timber. And then we will also post this video, uh, we'll edit it a bit, and we'll post it um, probably onto YouTube, maybe also on Facebook, maybe both. But you can just uh, do a search for VSU College of Agriculture uh, in Google, and you, it should come up with both, both our YouTube and our Facebook pages. Thank you for coming. And, um, if you'd like to be put on our mailing list, just go to that website. There's a, a link to uh, be put onto our events list, uh, ext.vsu.edu, to see all of our upcoming events.